Right, so now we'll do uh, something known as uh, denoising autoencoders. So the idea behind the denoising autoencoder is very simple. What you do is uh, you have your original x i. Okay, and now for the minute, uh, for a minute, just consider the discussion when your x i's are binary inputs. Okay, so each of these red guys can be between, uh, can be zero or one. Okay, now what I do is before feeding it this input to my autoencoder. The box is the autoencoder. What I do is I do a corruption. Okay, so the corruption is as follows. With probability q, I'll set x i j. That means one of these guys to zero, right? And with probability one minus q, I'll keep it as it is. Okay? So with some probability q, I am actually corrupting the data. Otherwise, I am retaining the data as it is. Okay, and then feeding that data to the autoencoder. Why would this work? Binary input case. As I said, just assume that the inputs are binary. We'll also see the other case. Why would this work? What was our problem earlier? That I was completely able to reconstruct the training data, right? But at test time, I had issues. Now, what I have done to the training data? corrupted it. Okay, just think for a minute what will happen now. I want someone to ask me a question in return. Oh, that is the corruption that I am choosing. Or oh, you could flip it is what you are saying. Yeah, if it is 0, change it to 1. So, that is also fine. That is the question I was expecting. What is the loss function now? What is the loss function? x hat my i minus x tilde i or x hat i minus x i. Which choice makes sense? First, let's the case take the case when I do x tilde i. What happens in that case? From this network's perspective, it's still learning to memorize the training data, right? It just this is what it thinks is the training data, and just trying to learn that transformation. Right? So it's not really helping my case. Do you understand that? I've just corrupted the training data. That's fine. But from the network's point of view, it still gets away by memorizing this data. And that is not what I want. So, what should I do? Can anyone tell me the, I mean, can everyone tell me the answers? Minimize the error between and xi. How many of you understand why that should help? All of you gave the answer, but only few of you raised your hand. It's so hard to deal, deal with this inconsistency. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, uh, okay. This helps because I am still going to minimize my original objective function. Okay. Now, can the network get away by copying the input to the output? So, input remember the input to the network is this and what I am trying to minimize is this. If I just copy x tilde i to the output, will my objective function be minimized? No. Right. So, it does not have incentive to copy now. So, what will it have to rely on? Say a reasonable probability 20 percent is the standard, right? So, even if I reconstruct, I will not get zero error, I will at least get some 20 percent error. Okay, so let us, let me give you an example and then let me know if you can figure out what happens. This example will contradict something else that we have done before, but just uh, play along. Suppose my input features were height, weight and BMI and we all know that BMI depends on height and weight. I hope all of us know. Now, can you think what is happening? I am corrupting one of these inputs and I still want everything to be reconstructed back. So, what will the network now have to rely on? It will have to now rely on this relations between these inputs also. So, again if I take my example of digit 3, I have corrupted some of these pixels, right? But I still want to be able to reconstruct 3. So, it will have to be smart enough to learn that if I have seen this and I have seen this, then there has to be something in between which gives me a 3. Do you get the intuition? Right? So, now I am making its job harder so that it is robust to changes at test time. That means at test time, if my digit looked something like this, it should still be able to predict it as a 3 or it should still be able to learn the same representation as 3. Do you get the intuition? Right? 
So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to somehow bring in the corruptions that I would expect at test case and trying to make the model more robust. It can no longer get away by memorizing the training data because I'm not feeding it the correct training data. It has to do something smarter than that. Everyone gets this? I'll come back to your question. Everyone gets this? Please raise your hands. Yes, yes, this is all under regularization. Yeah, this is regularization. No, no, no. So that's that case I've already made that uh, overfitting can happen in an overcomplete as well as undercomplete autoencoder. Everyone gets that, right? I show that example where it could happen in both the cases. So my figure may be overcomplete, but it can just happen in any of these. Is it fine? Okay. Fine. So it no longer makes sense for the network to just start copying the input data. Okay. Different kinds of noises means. Yeah, so let me try to answer that, right? So what probably you are trying to say is that all my input images were three, vertically written. I added some noise and managed it. But now at test time, suddenly you show me a three of this kind. And that will not work out. That's what, what your question was. A different types mean different values of the noise, 20%, 25% and so on. So we will first see a practical application in which autoencoders are used and then compare it to denoising at autoencoders. So this, uh, the next uh, few slides, uh, for those of you who may care, is also a small answer to the difference between machine learning and deep learning. Okay. So suppose you are given this task, which is handwritten digit recognition. I see everyone paying attention now. I should say this before every slide. Okay. So this is the task, handwritten digit recognition. You are given some data where you want to classify the digits into one of these 10 classes. The traditional machine learning approach to this is, you just construct a feature vector. This is a 28 cross 28 image. So I guess 28 cross 28 pixels, which is 784. I treat this as a feature vector and feed it to any of my machine learning algorithms, say SVM or multi-class SVM or logistic regression or any of these, right? And do a classification based on that. This is what you would have done in your machine learning course if I had given you this assignment, right? Okay. Now, the autoencoder approach or in general the deep learning approach would be, you take this data which is the original feature representation that you had. There is no engineering, feature engineering happening here, right? Ideally, I want to have features of the form that if pixel 25 comma 30 was black and if pixel 30 comma 20 was also black then probably I'm drawing a curve somewhere. So it could be one of these curvy digits and not one or any of these seven or any of these things, right? So you want to do some feature engineering. So typically in machine learning, what you do is you start with these 784 features, you observe a few things and you have these handcrafted features added on top of these, right? So you'll add some more features to the data. Now the deep learning approach is that you let, you also learn the features on their own. So how did we learn these features? We took this original input, we passed it to the autoencoder, which captured some of these relevant characteristics. The difference is we don't really know what these relevant characteristics are. That means you and I cannot read them and make sense of them. I cannot say that this pixel is actually capturing the interaction between, oh sorry, this neuron is actually capturing the interaction between my 700th pixel and 710th pixel. I can't do that. I could have handcrafted those features. If I believe that all my data is around the center, I could have handcrafted some features which say that capture the interactions between those. That's what you do in machine learning. Here you're trying to learn the features also on their own, right? What would happen if I add one more layer to this autoencoder? I'd learn even more complex interactions between these features. So this neuron is actually learning interactions between all the input neurons, okay? I add one more layer here. Again, this neuron will learn all the interactions between these abstract representations, right? So I could learn more and more abstract representations of the input. So I'm not doing feature engineering, I'm just throwing data at the network and I am assuming that it will learn better and better representations. Is that fine? Okay. Now I'm doing this in the autoencoder setup where actually I'm trying to optimize the objective function of minimizing this loss. And of course the square of this loss. Just fine. So first what I'll do is, I'm not happy with my original 784 dimensions. So I train a autoencoder to learn some k dimensions which are good. I know these are good because they are able to reconstruct the data perfectly to a certain extent, right? Of course, because you add uh, regularization, it may not be perfect, but it captures the essence of the data. You get that? So I have 
better dash representations now feature representations right my original feature representation was 784 i have come up with some better representations now what will i do was my task to learn feature representations what was it classification right so what will i do now is i'll i have learned this much from the auto encoder i'll throw away the last layer i don't care about the last layer what i care at the last layer is a classification problem right so i'll construct a new neural network where the first two layers of the network are the same as what i learned from the auto encoder and on top of that i'll add an output layer and now i'll try to train this network how many of you get what is happening here those of you don't get it can you ask me some questions okay let me just try to answer on my own uh you're like playing chess with yourself so so this is my original input 784 dimensions what i've learned with auto encoders is a smarter representation of this data okay now one simple solution that i have is i have this 100 dimensional data suppose this is the representation so for all the training examples instead of using that 784 dimension data and feeding it to a multi class svm what i can do is i can first compute this 100 dimensional representation and feed that to a multi class svm is that fine and you see that should work bet better in practice because i have reduced the dimensions i have reduced the dimensions smartly and now i can train this network is this fine all i am saying is instead of a multi class svm i could also have a neural network right i could feed that representation to a neural network so what would that neural network look like 100 what are the parameters here w belonging to 100 cos 10 how many if you get it now okay so this is what i could have done so i have learned a better feature representation and now i am using that representation to learn my classifier if i do this in an end to end manner that means my feature representations also came out of a neural network and my classifier is also a neural network then i have a complete end to end solution for that you get this okay fine now we'll uh, see a way of visualizing this and then we'll make some observations from the visualization so first let me tell you what the visualization is so i'm returning to the auto encoder setup so i had this input and i had these h dimensional or k dimensional hidden layer so i can think of each of these neurons as something which gets activated for a particular type of input is that fine what do i mean by activated its output would be remember this is the logistic neurons that we are talking about or even tanus neurons the output would be one okay so it is the maximum output that you could gain fine now so for example h1 is equal to sigmoid of this when would this fire when where w1 transpose xi is is very high right when you are in that regime where the sigmoid flattens right this regime okay when it's very high so i want to be able to maximize w1 transpose xi do you get this i want to be able to maximize this i want to find my w1 transpose is fixed now because i have trained the auto encoder i have got these weights this is all post mortem right i have trained the auto encoder i have got these weights now i want to find an input which will cause this particular neuron to fire okay so what is my max what is my optimization problem maximize just help me out maximize w1 transpose x let me just call it x and the optimization is with respect to x right because i want to find the x which maximizes this quantity my training is done i don't no longer care about changing w's my training has been done i am interested in finding x's which will maximally fire this okay so and i'm going to assume that all my inputs are normalized this just makes some analysis easier and remember that normalization is always okay you always do that so this is the optimization problem that i'm interested in solving what's the solution to this how many if you can solve this no no i want to find the x right so i've trained the auto encoder now i know all these so one i'm considering one column of the matrix w1 i want to see what is the input that i should give so that i'm sure that this neuron will get activated and i know that this neuron will get activated if i maximize this quantity right so i want to maximize that quantity and find an x such that it will get maximized i'm just hoping that no one brings in eigen vectors w1 is a column it's not a matrix just try to work it out what is this this is a dash between 
W1 transpose and XI dot product. When would the dot product be maximized? When they are both in the same direction, right? That means you know the direction is going to be XI is equal to and what did I want the norm to be? Now do you get it? Okay, fine. So, the solution is going to be this. Is this fine? W1 by the norm of W1. So, just remember that this quantity is going to get maximized when the dot product is maximized. The dot product is maximized when both Xi and W1 transpose are in the same direction, right? So, that means Xi should be in the same direction as W1 and I also wanted this constraint that Xi should be the norm of Xi should be 1. So, I am just dividing W1 by the norm of W1. Is this clear to everyone? How many of you get this? Okay. So, I know now what is the input I should feed to the network so that one of these neurons fires. Now, what I am going to do is I am going to plot the x size which maximize each of these neurons. I am going to consider some 100 neurons in the hidden layer and I am trying to find out the input image which is going to maximize or which is going to cause each of these neurons to fire. Do you get what I am trying to do? Even though you do not get why I am doing it, but do you get what I am trying to do? Okay. So, what am I going to do is this is a vector, right? So, I am just going to try to plot this as an image of the appropriate dimension. And this is what I get with a vanilla autoencoder where there was no noise. This is what I get, and this is for the MNIST digit data set, right? So, my data is 2, 3, 1, and so on digits. This is what happens when I get 25 percent noise and this is what happens when I get 50 percent. What do you understand from these figures? Remember that each of this is the figure which cause one particular neuron to fire. Is that clear? Each of these is a figure which caused one neuron to fire, one image. Yeah, one box corresponds to one column. Yeah, yeah. So, it is just that the dimension of the column is again 28 cross 28. So, I am just plotting it as a 28 by 28 image. So, I will just let me just clarify that is I think that is what I said here. So, what is the uh, dimension of this? In fact, you just know this right. The dimension of this is 28 cross 28 right. So, I can just take that vector and again plot it as a 28 cross 28 image. So, what I mean is uh, this is 784 right. So, x i is a 784 dimensional vector. I am just taking it as a 28 cross 28 image and plotting it because my inputs were actually images. So, I am just plotting those images fine. So, at least you see what I am doing here and what I am telling you is that each of these boxes that you see corresponds to one of these images. So, I had images x 1, x 2 up to x k such that each of these caused the kth neuron to fire ok. Now, what are you seeing here and what how do you make sense of what you are seeing? And remember in the MNIST, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, so, let us try to forget all this neural network and everything and let us just try to see, yes, the weights would be, uh, no, why do you say the weights are more distinct? Yeah, but on average you would be still reducing it, right? Okay, so let me just explain what is happening, then we can come back to this, okay. So, now uh, we have this setup, we had some input, we had a certain number of neurons here and then we had the output. Okay. This is what our uh, neural network was trying to do. Now, let us take this task of uh, recognizing a digit. Now, how do I actually recognize a digit? If I want to distinguish between a 9 and a 3, I would try to see if there is a curve in these positions and it is not there in this. Hence, this is a 3, this is a 9. That is something roughly like that, right. So, in other words, I now I have given delegated. So, that means what I do is I think of 3 as a combination of you get the idea as a combination of these images with these strokes right. So, this is actually this stroke, this is actually this stroke, uh, this is roughly this stroke and so on you get the idea. So, I think of 3 as a combination of many of these strokes right. Now, what I would like is if this guy could detect one of these strokes right. The other guy could detect one of these other strokes right. Now, you see that some of these strokes are shared across digits. For example, all these strokes here uh, look at the digit 9. These strokes are common to 3 and 9 both 
right. But some strokes would be missing for 3, some strokes would be missing for 9 and you would have extra strokes in both of these. So, now if each of these neurons could actually recognize these strokes, then a combination of the information that each of these neurons is capturing could help me decide whether it is a 3 or a 9. How many of you get that intuition? So, I would like each of these neurons to detect certain strokes, ok. That means, I would like this neuron, the first neuron to fire for an input like this, where there is a stroke at the bottom. I would like some other neuron to fire for a different input, where there is a stroke here. Now, can you relate this to what you are seeing in the picture, in the second and third picture? This neuron is firing for inputs which would have a stroke at the corner, right. And you see different neurons are firing for different strokes. So, each neuron is trying to capture something relevant and together now I could combine them to get the final output. How many of you see this? How many of you do not get this? So, you have to ask questions otherwise I cannot really help it. How many of you want me to go over this again? Which part? Yeah. So, let me just repeat what each of these boxes is, right. So, each of these boxes is the image which causes the kth neuron to fire, right. So, remember I decide I came up with this that this is the input which causes the second neuron to fire. What was the dimension of this input? 28 cross 28. So, I am just plotting that 28 cross 28 input, right. And I am realizing that this input seems to be something which has a dark spot here, right. So, now just related to the analogy that I am trying to give at the bottom that this neuron fires for inputs which have a stroke here. That is the stroke that it is capturing and there are other neurons which are trying to fire for other strokes and I would want these neurons to capture different strokes. So, that together they capture all the information in the image and help me decide that a combination of these strokes gives me a 9, a combination of these other strokes gives me a 3. Is that clear now to you also? So, yeah. So, now the thing is this right, uh, the again the same thing you could learn to reconstruct the output, but you may not capture the important characteristics in the input, right. So, now as you keep making its job harder, it has to rely on capturing these important characteristics in the input, right. And actually if you look at the difference between the second figure and the third figure, right, let us look at the same guy here. So, you see that this is actually thicker and wider, the stroke that you see here is thicker and wider. So, now it is actually relying on more neighborhood information to fire. It is not firing just for this stroke, but it is firing for a larger stroke. It also requires more neighborhood information because you are corrupting the bits. So, it has to rely on information from the other guys. The same example that I gave for height, uh, weight and body mass index, right, the same thing holds here. I have corrected, corrupted a lot of inputs. So, now it will fire only if it gets a lot of information from the neighboring inputs also. Is that fine? Ok. And I now coming back to your question. Uh, yeah, I do realize now what you are saying that the weights are actually becoming larger. Yeah, it makes it more robust. But again, uh, so regularization just does not always mean that your weights have to be small, right. That is one way of constraining or regularizing. But this is another way of regularizing where you are making it more robust, but it does not necessarily need to lead to the same solution where you have smaller weights. Does that make sense? Is this ok for most of you? Can you please raise your hands if this is ok? Uh, and this is the same thing that I have written here, ok. Now, we saw one form of this function, ok, which was uh, just flip the input if the output is, uh, just corrupt the input, right. You could also add a Gaussian noise. So, you could take the input, add a Gaussian noise to it with 0 mean and then again try to reconstruct the original input back. Is that fine? So, you could just use different noise functions to do this. So, we will now see such a denoising autoencoder where we have actually added a Gaussian noise instead of the 0 1 noise or the corruption that we were doing, right. Yeah. So, the purpose of this particular uh, example that I am giving is to compare uh, an autoencoder which is regularized by adding this Gaussian noise with an autoencoder which is regularized by using weight decaying, right, the L2 regularization. So, L2 regularization is also known as weight decaying because you kind of decay the weights, right, you force the weights to be small. 
So what they showed is that with a denoising autoencoder using a Gaussian noise, you actually learn something known as edge detectors. Right? So you see all of these are trying to detect edge. Again the same thing is happening. I am plotting the images which will maximally cause a particular neuron to fire and it looks like all these neurons fire for different edge patterns in your original data. So now they are capturing all the edges in the data and a combination of these edges should tell you what your final class is. Okay? And this seems to work much better than the weight decay filter which is not really capturing any regular pattern. Okay, so this is just an empirical evidence that uh, an autoencoder with a Gaussian noise seems to do better than an autoencoder with the L2 regularization. Okay.